Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, we are into third lecture of our course ADR and Arbitration and this lecture will be on Arbitration and Arbitral Awards. This again remains a basic lecture on these two fundamental concepts Arbitration and Arbitral Award. Before I start the session, uh, let me quickly go back to what we discussed in the previous session. We tried to understand the way arbitration law has evolved in India from regulations to code of civil procedure and then we finally saw how Indian law was, Indian Arbitration Act was made. Then there was an Arbitration Act of 1940, there were two laws related to enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. All these laws which we had were consolidated in the form of one Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996 we understood uh, that there are four pillars on which Arbitration Conciliation Act rests. We emphasized on the general principles. We saw how the tribunal is obliged to remain neutral and objective to both the parties. We saw the structure of this act. Part one of Arbitration Conciliation Act relates to domestic arbitration. Part 2 has got two chapters. Chapter 1 relates to enforcement of New York Convention Awards. Chapter 1 reenacts 1961 Act. Chapter 2 of Part 2 is for enforcement of Geneva Convention Awards. It reenacts the 1937 Act. Part 3 is conciliation. Part 4 is rulemaking. That is what we have discussed so far. Now, in this lecture, we will talk about, as I said, the basic concepts of what is arbitration and what is an arbitral award. And if you see the keywords, by the end of this session, you will be in a position to understand what is domestic arbitration, what is international commercial arbitration, what are the features of arbitration, what do we mean by an arbitral award, what are the various kinds of arbitral award. So, we can start now. As I have been saying from my first lecture that arbitration as a mode of dispute resolution is an alternative to the existing court system. Arbitration is an alternative to existing justice delivery system. I have been saying that on one extreme we have litigation, on the other extreme we have ADR which includes mediation, conciliation, etc. In between these two I will place arbitration. Why? Because I have already mentioned that arbitration has certain features similar to litigation and it has certain features similar to ADR. What are similar features to litigation? Litigation is binding, arbitration is also binding. Litigation is adversarial, arbitration is also adversarial where parties are pitted against each other, standing against each other. Litigation is non-voluntary but arbitration is voluntary. Litigation is non-consensual but arbitration is consensual. So, on these aspects, arbitration is close to ADR. One significant point of difference between litigation and arbitration is the element of confidentiality or the element of privacy which we discussed in the first session. That whatever happens in the process of arbitration, it is done in private and therefore will remain private. This is one feature of arbitration which attracts the disputants towards the process of arbitration. But before anything, let us understand what do we mean by arbitration. Ancitral model law, Article 2, Clause A defines arbitration. And what is the definition given? Arbitration means any arbitration. Arbitration means any arbitration, so it is no definition. Arbitration means any arbitration, whether or not administered by a permanent arbitral institution. So, again there is no definition. This is not a definition. It is only a classification. Arbitration means any arbitration, whether it is administered by a permanent arbitral institution or whether it is, it is done without any permanent arbitral institution. 
So it only tells me the classification. There can be two kinds of arbitration. One is that which is done by arbitral institution. One is that which is not done by arbitral institution. So we don't have any definition in Article 2A. Now coming to Indian Act, Section 21A defines the arbitration. And interestingly, we have the same definition here also. Arbitration means any arbitration, whether or not administered by permanent arbitral institution. English law is also silent on this point. There is no clear definition given in any legislation, whether model law or Indian law or English law. Now, Halsbury Law of England defines it. And I will read, you listen to me carefully. Arbitration means the reference of a dispute or difference between no less than two parties for determination after hearing both sides in a judicial manner by a person or persons other than a court of competent jurisdiction. So, what is arbitration? It means there is a dispute between not less than two parties. The dispute is referred to a body, a person other than court for determination. There is a dispute which is referred to a person or body of persons other than court for determination. How the body will determine it? By hearing the parties in a judicial manner. So, if there is a body which is giving hearing to both the parties in judicial manner, to decide their matter which has been referred by parties themselves to that body and that body is not court, then it is arbitration. So, what I am trying to say, even Halsbury's law of England is not a precise definition of arbitration. arbitration. What at best it is doing, it is giving me certain features of arbitration. There will be a person or body of persons that is not a court that body is obliged to act in a judicial manner, that body is obliged to give hearing, that body is determining the matter between A and B and that matter has gone to that body because it has been referred by A and B only. So, if these features are present, then the process may be called as arbitration. So, this is the best definition we have. Now, in a situation where we do not have a good definition, we can have description of that term. So, instead of trying to define it, the better method will, would be to, to find out the features of arbitration or attributes of arbitration. But before that, let me tell you the advantage of arbitration. By now, I am sure you have some idea about the process of arbitration. It is a, a binding process. It is something similar to adversarial process. It is a process in which parties refer the matter for, for resolution, for determination to a tribunal which is chosen by the parties themselves and the tribunal is under a duty to act in a judicial manner. The strength of this process is it gives a binding decision. The decision is final and binding on both the parties. So, strength of arbitration is it comes out with a binding decision and flexibility of arbitration is it recognizes party autonomy. I have been talking about party autonomy in, in, in last two lectures also. Party autonomy is the extent of, of choices which parties can make in the process of arbitration from deciding who shall be the arbitrator to deciding whether award shall be, shall be reasoned award or not. There are n number of decisions which parties have to make and that is what I am saying party autonomy. So, it is binding and it has party autonomy. So, if you ask me to give one line explaining the advantage of arbitration, I will say arbitration, the advantage of arbitration is it comes with strength in the form of binding decision with flexibility in the form of party autonomy. Now, as I said before, because we are not in a position to define arbitration, the best definition I could give you is one from Halsbury Law of England, which only describes the phenomena of arbitration. 
So therefore, we will have to understand the attributes of arbitration. Before that, there is one observation which is relevant. You must have read section 28 of Indian Contract Act. It says any agreement that prevents or restricts an aggrieved party from seeking remedy in a relevant court or tribunal in the case of a breach of contract is null and void. So it, what it says in essence is any agreement in restraint of legal proceeding is void. You must have studied this provision in general principles of contract. According to this provision, section 28 of Indian Contract Act, any agreement that extinguishes a party's rights or releases either party from obligation is null and void. So the bottom line in section 28 is any agreement in restraint of legal proceeding is null and void. Arbitration agreement essentially is an agreement in restraint of legal proceeding. What is an arbitration agreement? We will talk more about it in our next lecture, meaning of arbitration agreement. But broadly, what does it mean? Arbitration agreement is an agreement to arbitrate present or future disputes. When you and me agree to do some business together, to do some transaction together, we also write in our contract that in case any dispute arises, we will refer the matter to arbitration for resolution. And the arbitral tribunal will pass a binding order. So what is an arbitration agreement? It is an agreement to arbitrate in future. It is an agreement that we will arbitrate. So it is an agreement to arbitrate means what? We are not going to go to litigation. This is an agreement in restraint of legal proceeding. Essentially, arbitration agreement is an agreement in restraint of legal proceeding. So therefore, it violates Section 28 of Indian Contract Act. Since it violates Indian Contract Act, you cannot have arbitration agreement. You cannot have arbitration agreement because that would be violative of Section 28 of Indian Contract Act. But then exception of the same provision says that it does not render any written contract between two or more persons who have already referred a dispute to arbitration with their permission invalid. So what Section 28 says that any agreement in restraint of legal proceeding is, is void. However, arbitration agreement is an exception to the rule. So before anything, let us clarify the situation that arbitration agreements are not hit by section 28 of Indian Contract Act. Let's go back to meaning of the term arbitration. I said arbitration as defined in Indian Act section 21A, it says arbitration means any arbitration whether or not administered by permanent arbitral institutions. So I said it is not a definition. It can at best be considered as classification. So arbitration can be of two kinds. One which is not administered by permanent institution, the other which is administered by permanent institution. So we don't have the definition. We refer to Halsbury law, which says that there is, there is a body of persons other than court it gets the matter referred by the parties for determination. It has to determine it by acting in a judicial manner. If that is the story, it is arbitration. Now, let us identify the attributes of arbitral process. And on the basis of these attributes, let's construct some definition in your mind. Because otherwise, we don't have a definition. The first attribute is reference by the parties. We are talking about voluntary arbitration. We are talking about consensual arbitration. We are not talking about section 89 CPC. We are not talking about court induced arbitration. So in this case, in voluntary arbitration under Arbitration Conciliation Act 1996, the reference of dispute to the tribunal has to be made by the parties. Parties in their agreement have to write that in case there is any dispute arising out of this contract, the same shall be referred to arbitration. Now, once the dispute arises, it will not automatically go to the tribunal. It has to be specifically referred to the tribunal by an act 
try and understand i have entered into an agreement there is a contract between you and me to do some business there is a clause in that contract which says that any present or future dispute shall be resolved by way of arbitration when a dispute arises how will that dispute go to the tribunal for determination it will not go there on its own there has to be an overt act there has to be an act of submission that is called submission agreement so every arbitration agreement finally leads to what submission agreement when parties submit their dispute for determination to arbitrator that is what is the first point here reference of the dispute for determination to the tribunal has to be made by the parties point number 1 second as we saw in the definition of ancitral as we saw in the definition of indian act arbitration means any arbitration whether or not administered by permanent arbitral institution it means the tribunal may be a permanent tribunal an institutional tribunal it may be an ad hoc tribunal the arbitration may be administered by an institution permanent institution it may not be a case like that third the dispute must be arbitrable as we'll see in in other lectures we will talk about arbitrability of dispute but broadly you can understand that criminal matters are not arbitrable there are certain cases like consumer matters or or tenancy matters these are the matters which relate to interest of a weaker section tenant is a weaker section so all these beneficial legislations consumer protection act or tenancy acts disputes arising out of these are not arbitrable ip disputes not arbitrable there are many such disputes which are not arbitrable so therefore what is arbitration you are referring what a dispute what kind of dispute which is essentially arbitrable at one point of time our court said that fraud is not arbitrable if there is a matter in which allegation of fraud is involved it is not arbitrable today we are saying that mere allegation of fraud it is arbitrable so it's a dynamic list therefore and we'll have to understand what is arbitrable what is not what can be resolved by the arbitral tribunal what is not so therefore a reference has to be made by the parties to the tribunal to determine a case to resolve a case and what disputes can be referred only those disputes which are arbitrable so if an award is passed by the tribunal with respect to a dispute which was essentially not arbitrable such award can be set aside if there is an award passed by a tribunal on a dispute which was in the first place not arbitrable such an award is liable to be set aside fourth point the number of arbitrators must be uneven we will talk about section 10 and see that section 10 requires that the number must not be even why it is so because if you have even number of arbitrators there is a possibility that no majority is constituted there are two arbitrators one says yes the other says no no decision can be taken so law broadly says that the number of arbitrators must be uneven the appointment next point the appointment of arbitrators will have to be made according to the provisions in this act arbitration conciliation act if you want to call your process as arbitration then appointment has to be done according to the provisions of arbitration conciliation act we'll talk about section 11 it gives you a detailed procedure as to how arbitrator must be appointed who can be the arbitrator you decide how will you appoint arbitrator you decide but in case you fail to decide parties fail to decide then there is a default procedure given this is how you have to go 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 ahead and appoint your arbitrator so matter has to be referred to the tribunal by the parties themselves can, there can be institutional arbitration there can be an arbitration which is not administered by institution an important thing is the dispute in question must be arbitrable another important aspect is that the number of arbitrator must not be even 
And we just saw that appointment of arbitrators be done according to the Act. I refer to Section 11. We will be discussing Section 11 in detail. The next point is members must be unbiased. What do we mean by biased arbitrator? You understand nobody should be a judge in his own case because that will lead to what? A biased decision. And as far as rule against bias is concerned, you, you must have studied that it is not important for you to prove what bias must have done against you. It is only this much for you to prove that the man was biased. What actually happened is not important for you to do. What I mean to say, there must be appearance of justice. You cannot allow a biased judge to take a decision in your case because there won't be appearance of justice. Justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. You must have studied it in administrative law. So appearance of justice will come if the judge is objective, if judge is unbiased. So members of the tribunal must be unbiased. And how do we ensure it? We will discuss in detail that section 12 ensures that anybody who is approached to become an arbitrator is under an obligation to inform the existence of circumstances which may cast doubt on his independence and impartiality. Anybody who is approached to become an arbitrator, if you come to me and request me to become your arbitrator, and if I think that I have some connection with you or with the other party or with the subject matter in dispute. If I am going to gain out of the award, if I have some shares in the company which is one of the party to the dispute, if the counsel representing, if the advocate representing one of the parties is a family member, there may be n number of reasons for biasness then it is my duty to inform the parties that, look, these are the situation. This may create doubt on my independence. This may create doubt on my impartiality. So you have to take a decision whether you want to continue with me or you want to take some other person as your arbitrator. Because the law requires unbiased member to be the arbitrator. So reference has to be done by the parties. Dispute must be arbitrable. There must be uneven number of arbitrators. Appointment of arbitrators must be done according to provisions of this Act. Member of tribunals must be unbiased. Proceeding must be done in a judicial manner. Proceeding must be done in a judicial manner. What do we mean by judicial manner? There are two ways of doing something. One is acting ministerially. The other is acting judicially. Acting ministerially means acting according to my discretion, acting according to my expertise. Acting judicially means acting on the basis of submission made by the parties. Try and understand. This is the fundamental difference. If I am obliged, if I am allowed to take decision on the basis of my understanding of the subject, take decision on the basis of my discretion, then this decision making cannot be arbitration. It is acting ministerially. Only that decision making which is done in a judicial manner, which is done on the basis of submission made by the parties, only that can be arbitration. So therefore, proceeding has to be conducted in judicial manner means proceeding has to be conducted on the basis of submission of the parties, pleading of the parties, not on the discretion of the arbitrator. Next. Arbitral process is a private process, it is not a public process. Privacy is a big advantage of ADR generally, arbitration specifically. Because processes are private, therefore parties are encouraged to go for arbitration. Because they know that whatever will be done in the process of arbitration will not be disclosed to non-parties or third party. Next point, party autonomy is maintained. I have mentioned this point in previous lectures also. Party autonomy means the possibility of choices 
which parties are allowed to make within the arbitration arbitral process throughout the arbitral process large number of choices can be made by the arbit by the parties so therefore too much of party autonomy is 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 maintained in the process of arbitration and the last point written here is award is final and binding i have already mentioned that the outcome of an arbitral process is a binding award arbitration does not lead to settlement between the parties it leads to a binding award and that award is final between the parties same matter cannot be raised in arbitration again res judicata applies the principle of res judicata applies now what i am trying to say is if these attributes are present invariably the process will be called as arbitration this is an exercise similar to what we saw in helsbury law of england so there is a body of persons other than court which have been given the matter referred by the parties the dispute in question must be arbitrable that body of persons must consist of uneven number of people and their appointment must be done by the provisions of arbitration conciliation act those members must be unbiased they must be obliged to act in a judicial manner they are not acting in public they are not doing it in open like court they will have to maintain party autonomy they have to respect party autonomy and they have to pass an award which is final and binding now going back to what we saw in the first slide section 21a of the arbitration conciliation act it says arbitration means any arbitration whether or not administered by permanent arbitral institution arbitration is any arbitration whether or not administered by permanent arbitral institution i said it does not give me the definition it gives me classification there can be two kinds of arbitration one is called ad hoc arbitration the other is called institutional arbitration ad hoc arbitration is where the parties and the tribunal will conduct the arbitration according to procedure which will either be agreed by the parties or in default of agreement laid down by the tribunal at a preliminary meeting what i'm trying to say is ad hoc arbitration is an agreed upon arbitration an arbitration arranged by the parties it is a tribunal in which the procedure according to which arbitration has to be done is to be decided by the parties and if parties don't do it it shall be done by the tribunal in its preliminary meetings okay fine we'll do arbitration according to this method this is ad hoc arbitration ad hoc arbitration is not encouraged because there is a possibility that in preparing set of rules for your arbitration you may skip certain important aspects which may lead to litigation you understand you have to prepare your own code for arbitration something similar to cpc for litigation what procedure shall be followed by you how will you conduct the hearing how submissions will be made in arbitration what shall be the content of pleading in arbitration so every single thing is to be decided by the parties and if parties don't do it then tribunal has to do it in case of default the tribunal has to do it but this mechanism is to be discouraged on the ground because government also discourages it i will refer to few developments which took place which convince me that government is also discouraging the phenomena of ad hoc arbitration so ad hoc arbitration is all controlled by parties they will decide the rules they will set the prepare the set of rules on the other hand ad hoc arbitration i said is all arranged by the parties and if parties fail to do it then in that case tribunal has to do it no other option on the other hand institutional arbitration is administered by an arbitral institution for example in india let's take the example of arbitration council of india 
Arbitration Council of India provides services of arbitration. They will have the panel of arbitrators from which they will appoint arbitrator for your case. They will have rules which they apply for their arbitration. Their rules are fairly scientific. Their rules do not violate public policy of India. Their rules do not violate Arbitration Conciliation Act of India. So it will be wise if you refer to the institutional rules. Because those rules have been scientifically made, keeping into account all possibilities. Keeping into account the Indian public policy. Keeping into account the Indian law of arbitration and conciliation. Or internationally, you can choose some institution. For example, International Chamber of Commerce is one such body, SIAC, Singapore International Arbitration Center. There is an arbitration center in Hong Kong. So International Chamber of if 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 we are doing business, we are in we are into a contract, and we have written that in case any dispute arises, we'll refer it to International Chamber of Commerce for resolution. There is an ICC clause which is mentioned in the slide, you can see ICC institutional arbitration clause. All disputes arising in connection with the present contract shall be finally settled under the rules of conciliation and arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce by one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with the said rules. You don't have to do anything now. You just have to incorporate this clause in your contract saying that all disputes arising in connection with the present contract shall be finally settled under the rules of conciliation and arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce by one or more arbitrators to be appointed according to the rules. So you don't have to lay down those rules. Rules are already there. You just have to refer those rules. It brings a lot of certainty because now when you do it according to institutional rules, these institutions ensure that no issue remains unattended. They have rule, they have answer to all possible eventualities. And therefore, possibility of litigation reduces. In 2017, a high-powered committee appointed by Government of India submitted its report on the aspect of promoting institutionalization of arbitration in India. How to promote institutionalization of arbitration? How to promote institutional arbitration over ad hoc arbitration? Because the way we are doing ad hoc arbitration, it is extremely diverse. Different people are doing it in a different way. What shall be the method of appointment of arbitrator? It is, it is, there are hundreds of ways people are adopting by, by referring to ad hoc arbitration. If we start adopting institutional arbitration, we will be in a position to streamline the entire process of arbitration in India. Therefore, there are proposals, recommendations. In fact, amendments have been done in 2019 based on the recommendation of the high-powered committee. And these amendments have been done so as to promote institutional arbitration in India. So what I said, the definition does not give me definition, but it at least gives me the classification. One is ad hoc arbitration, which is completely managed by the parties. Rules have to be adopted by the parties. And second is institutional arbitration, where rules are pre-existing. You only have to refer to that institution for the purpose of your arbitration. The second classification can be, first is ad hoc arbitration, institutional arbitration. Second is domestic arbitration and international commercial arbitration. Now, these terms, for example, domestic arbitration word has been used in the title, but it has not been defined in that. Domestic arbitration has not been defined in that. Now, we have to create a definition. Now, if you have a copy of Bear Act, I will advise you to sit with a copy of Bear Act so that in future lectures you will be in a position to refer to some of the provisions which I will be mentioning. Or alternatively, I will try to reproduce those provisions here in my slides. 
Section 2.2 of the Arbitration Conciliation Act says this part that is part 1 of the Act, this part shall apply where the place of arbitration is in India. Now the simplest meaning is that this shall apply where the place is in India, this will not apply where the place is not in India. So entire part 1 is good for India seated arbitration. Section 2, subsection 2, 2.2 two says this part that means part 1 of the act shall apply where the place of arbitration is in India. Means it will only apply with respect to India seated arbitration. Second point, section 2, subsection 7. 2.7 two seven of the act says an arbitral award made under this part under this part means under part 1, an arbitral award made under this part shall be considered as a domestic award. So there are two things which I mentioned, this part shall apply part 1, this part shall apply where the place is in India, place of arbitration is in India and second point section 2 subsection 7 says an arbitral award made under this part shall be considered as domestic award. Now it only defines domestic award. This part shall apply where the place of arbitration is in India. Any award passed under this part is a domestic award. Now what I will do, I will add these two. First is this part shall apply where the place is in India. Place of arbitration is in India. An award passed under this part is a domestic award. Now if I add these two, I get some kind of definition. Arbitration held in India the outcome of which is a domestic award under part 1. An arbitration which is done in India, the outcome of which is a domestic award under part 1 of the act is a domestic arbitration. So therefore, there are two points which I am referring to. Domestic arbitration is an arbitration which is done in India. Domestic arbitration is an arbitration which leads to domestic award. Right. So domestic arbitration is an arbitration done in India. Domestic arbitration is an arbitration which leads to a domestic award. So it is India seated arbitration. The next word is international commercial arbitration. First classification is ad hoc arbitration, institutional arbitration. Second classification is domestic arbitration, international commercial arbitration. And fortunately, we have a definition of international commercial arbitration in section 21F. Section 21F gives me the ingredients of international commercial arbitration. There is a dispute which arises out of legal relationship. That legal relationship can be contractual, can be because of any other reason. Contractual legal relationship, I and you enter into a contract and develop a legal relationship. There can be legal relationship based on statute act establishes a legal relationship between you and me. There can be legal relationship established by some common law principles. So there is a dispute arising out of legal relationship. Now that legal relationship can be contractual, can be otherwise. And that dispute is considered as commercial according to laws for the timing in force, Indian laws. So there is a dispute which arises out of legal relationship. This legal relationship can be contractual, can be otherwise and the dispute is considered as commercial. These are the conditions and one additional condition is one party has got some foreign element in it. One party at least both the parties can be foreign, foreign parties. At least one party must have some foreign element in the sense that he can be a national of some foreign country, he can be habitual resident of some foreign country, it can be a company incorporated in foreign country, it can be government of a foreign country. If these conditions are fulfilled, the arbitration in question can be called as international commercial arbitration. Try and understand this point clearly. Domestic arbitration is territory specific definition. Domestic arbitration is territory specific definition. 
an arbitration done in india is domestic arbitration international commercial arbitration depends on nature of the parties an arbitration between parties where at least one of the party has got international character an arbitration between an indian and a foreigner is an international commercial arbitration an arbitration between two foreigners is an international commercial arbitration and if that international commercial arbitration is done in india it is also a domestic arbitration i will repeat it domestic arbitration is territory specific definition if you are doing your arbitration in india it is domestic arbitration if it is between two indians it is domestic arbitration only if it is between parties where at least one of the party has got international character foreign national foreign government a company incorporated in foreign country if at least one of the party has got international character it is domestic but at the same time it is international commercial arbitration now if you understand the difference between domestic arbitration and ica international commercial arbitration means ica then i will use some words for my convenience if an arbitration is done in india it is domestic arbitration if it is done between parties where at least one party has got international character i will call it ica international commercial arbitration if both the parties are indians it is a domestic arbitration other than ica it is a domestic arbitration other than ica such arbitrations i will call such arbitrations as pure domestic arbitration this is not a statutory nomenclature but i will use this nomenclature for such arbitrations so ica international commercial arbitration is defined on the basis of nature of the party whereas domestic arbitration term is defined on the basis of place of arbitration as as it is written if the arbitration is done in india under part 1 of the act if the arbitration is done in india it is domestic arbitration and it leads to domestic award if one of the party has got international character it remains domestic arbitration the award remains a domestic award but the arbitration will also be called as international commercial arbitration the next part is arbitral award the definition of arbitral award arbitration act 1940 defined award award means any arbitral award no definition award means any arbitral award this is no definition the 1996 act the model law ancestral model law the english act all these are silent on the definition of an arbitral award what do we mean by an arbitral award section 21c of indian act defines an arbitral award and if you look into the definition it says arbitral award includes an interim award that's it something same as what we saw in the definition of arbitration arbitration means any arbitration whether or not administered by permanent arbitral institution a similar story an arbitral award includes interim award fine interim award is also an arbitral award but what do we mean by an arbitral award is not clear from the definition in fact we'll have to describe it that is what has been done you see an award is the discharge of the mandate either wholly or partly entrusted to the tribunal by the parties so parties have given to the tribunal a mandate to decide the dispute and the discharge of this mandate is done by way of an arbitral award discharge of this mandate is done by way of an arbitral award so as i said uh, section 21c of the act defines arbitral award it says arbitral award includes an interim award that is not good enough so therefore award has to be described an award is discharge of mandate by the arbitral tribunal what is the mandate given to arbitral tribunal 
to decide the dispute. So, a discharge of this mandate to decide the dispute is done by way of an arbitral award. An award is concerned with the substance of the dispute. There are many decisions which the tribunal will make in the process of making of the award. Now, all those procedural decisions which tribunal will make in the process of making of the award, those decisions are not award. So, all the decisions which lead up to making of award are not award. Award is concerned with the substance of the dispute only. Let us quickly see what are the features of an arbitral award. All the awards are decision of the tribunal as I said, but all the decisions are not award. Only those decisions which have to do with the substance of the dispute, only those decisions can be called as an arbitral award. Second, an arbitral award concludes the dispute as to the specific issue. If it is a final award, it will terminate the mandate of the tribunal. So, jurisdiction of the tribunal comes to an end when a final award is passed. An award disposes of parties' respective claims. It finally resolves the matter, disposes of the matter. The respective claims are disposed of. An award is fit to be recognized. An award is fit to be enforced. A domestic award is enforced in section 36 according to mechanism of CPC. A foreign award is enforced under both the chapters of part 2. We will talk more about it later on. An award can be challenged in a court of law in section 34. Again, we will have discussion on that. An award may be final award. An award may be partial award. So, these are some of the features of an arbitral award. So, what is very important? It concludes the issue which it decides. It disposes of the claims. All the decisions are not award, only those decisions of the tribunal which relate to the substance of the dispute, only those decisions are award. Award can be final, award can be partial. So, let us see what are the kinds of award. We have understood my section 21A does not give me a definition, it only tells me that interim awards are also awards. We have understood that award is a kind of discharge of mandate by the tribunal. What is that mandate? Mandate is to det determine the dispute. Who has given this mandate to the tribunal? Parties have given this mandate. So, this mandate is discharged by way of a decision which is called as arbitral award. Arbitral award can be of many kinds. First is interim award. Because you see occasionally the tribunal is called upon to give a partial award particularly when certain claims are admitted by the opposite party. Out of four claims which I am presenting, one is admitted by the opposite party. In that case, I may request the tribunal to kindly pass an award with respect to that particular issue. You understand? So, there are four issues raised by me. Out of these four, one is admitted by the opposite party. I will request the tribunal to pass a partial award with respect to that particular claim. Such awards are in the nature of interim awards. Such awards are in the nature of partial awards. It is provisionally made subject to final award. So, validity of partial award, interim award, it depends on the final award. It is subject to final award. Otherwise, it is final with respect to issue which is addressed by this award. So, out of four issues, if the partial award disposes of one of the issue, it is a final award with respect to that issue, unless there is something contrary to it in the final award. This is called interim award. The second kind of award is final award. There is no definition of final award in this act, but we can understand an award which finally determines all the claims and issues involved between the parties, it is conclusive unless it is set aside. Between the parties, it is final, it is binding 
and once a final award is passed the tribunal becomes defunct a tribunal becomes defunct once the final award is passed we will talk about it in section 32 of the act the mandate of the tribunal shall terminate once a final award is passed but then there are certain exceptions there are four situations when the mandate of the tribunal shall continue even after passing the final award first is when an award which has been passed by the tribunal is challenged in a court and court instead of setting aside the award remits the award back to the tribunal for removing the ground of challenge there is an award passed by the tribunal that award has been challenged in a court and the court is not setting it aside it is remitting it back to the tribunal for removing the ground of challenge correct it remove the ground on the basis of which the award has been challenged now a final award has been passed when the court remits the award back to the tribunal for removing the ground of challenge the mandate even after termination mandate has already terminated once the final award is passed but that mandate revives this happens in section 34 similarly there are three more situations where mandate of the tribunal although it has terminated once final award is passed it revives for example for correction of error there may be an award where there may be some typographical error computational error clerical error in order to correct those errors parties may request the tribunal to revive its jurisdiction and make the corrections so mandate will revive for correction of errors mandate will revive in case you need some interpretation to be done by the arbitral tribunal an award has been passed parties are unable to understand the meaning of that award parties can request the tribunal to interpret the award for them and for that purpose although final award has been passed the mandate revives and the fourth point fourth situation when the mandate revives is when an additional award is to be passed out of 10 issues which parties have referred to the tribunal for determination tribunal has decided nine it has not decided the 10th issue then in that case even after the final award is passed the parties can request the tribunal to revive the mandate and pass an additional award an additional award which becomes part of the earlier final award so what i am saying once final award is passed the mandate terminates final award is binding on the parties final award is conclusive between the parties final award terminates the mandate of the tribunal except in these four situations when the court remits it back when the mandate revives for correction of error when mandate revives for interpretation of the of the award when the mandate revives for the purpose of passing an additional award the next kind of award can be successive award it means separate award for separate submissions arising out of the same contract you and me entered into a contract performance of contract starts during the performance of contract a dispute arose we referred it to the tribunal another dispute arose we referred it to the tribunal the tribunal is passing award one after the other these are successive awards there is a case called as dolphin drilling limited versus ongc limited dolphin drilling limited versus ongc limited this is 2010 3 supreme court the issue was whether once invoked the arbitration clause cannot be invoked again there is a contract dispute arose we invoke the arbitration clause can that arbitration clause be again invoked to refer the matter for arbitration can there be successive references court said it is possible there may be various references on the basis of same arbitration clause another question which arose was are we bound 
to refer all these disputes to the same tribunal? Court said it is not necessary. A particular party can insist that issue number one will go to tribunal number one. Issue number two to four will go to tribunal number two. That can be done. And if you want to avoid this situation, you will have to write all these things in your arbitration clause, in your arbitration agreement. We'll talk about these things later on. So therefore, you can have interim award, you can have final award, you can have successive awards. There is another term called as additional award, which I just mentioned for the purpose of additional award, the mandate will revive even after passing the final award. Why? Because there possibly one or two issues have not been answered. So therefore, in order to answer those issues, the tribunal may be requested to revive the mandate and pass an additional award. There is one more point involved here called a settlement award, which is there in section 30. We'll have some discussion in, on section 30 later on. Section 30 is similar to section 89 of CPC. Section 89 is an opt-out provision where parties get an opportunity to come out of litigation. Section 30 is also an opt-out provision where parties get an opportunity to come out of arbitration. Section 30 puts a duty on the arbitral tribunal to ensure that, to encourage parties. Arbitral tribunal has to encourage parties to go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution. Go for other methods. If you are successful in doing mediation and conciliation, we will accept the settlement as an award. So if parties are encouraged by the tribunal to go for settlement, and if parties accept the proposal of arbitral tribunal and they go for mediation, and tomorrow if there is successful settlement, section 30 says, the arbitral tribunal shall record that settlement and the settlement gets the status of a settlement award. Such settlement award is enforceable in the same manner like any other award. This is settlement award. We'll talk more about it maybe in the later ses sessions. So what we discussed, we tried to understand the meaning of arbitration, kinds of arbitration. We saw that Indian Act does not provide a very good definition of arbitration. Same is the case with arbitral award. So we try to understand the features of arbitration. We try to understand the attributes of an arbitral award. We understood various kinds of an arbitral award, interim, final, successive, additional award, settlement award. So if we understand the basic ideas of arbitration and award, in the next lecture, we can start with our discussion on arbitration agreement. Before I conclude, there is one point which you have to keep in mind before we start our next session. There cannot be an arbitration unless there is an arbitration agreement. So arbitration agreement is the stepping stone for starting the arbitration. And second point is, if there is an arbitration agreement, then there has to be an arbitration. We'll discuss this aspect in the next lecture. That's all for, 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 for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.